remain standing. There's one thing about music. Uh, it's kind of one of those new universal things. No matter who you are, what religion you are, music always brings something out. Whenever you hear the right one, it just kind of really blesses you. Uh, you repeat after me, Second Chronicles. And my people who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their evil ways, and I will bring them from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their hands. Be a pledge to the Bible, or allegiance to the Bible. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the Bible. God is over her. I will make it a man. So I just ask that you would be with 
be with the leaders of other countries and their dealings with Israel. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together this morning. We ask that you bless this service, that you give Pastor Carr the words that you want him to speak. All of these things I ask in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Just want to make sure so I don't forget, don't forget. Next Sunday at 3 o'clock we have our annual putt putt game, Paradise Park. Donations uh, is uh, the ticket to get you in, anything you want to donate. But it's a ministry that uh, the Novics do. Y'all can't hear me? Is that better? Okay. But this is a ministry. Ooh, turn that down. <laughs> That's going to hurt somebody's ears in a minute. It's a ministry that the Novics do, and it's a wonderful praise and worship time. A lot of fun, a lot of fellowship. So make sure that you schedule next Sunday, 3 o'clock, on your calendar of events. So what do you call a smoothie with granola in it? What do you call a smoothie with granola in it? A roughie. Thank you, I'll be here all weekend. We're going to look, we're going to look at Psalms 95 today. We're still on the subject of fresh worship. Last week, um, I challenged you for those that God was speaking to on fresh worship to set a time and give God praise every morning. <coughs> Or something different that happened to you that day so that you can have fresh worship every morning. Hopefully you took that challenge. If you didn't take that challenge, I hope you take it this week. It's worth it. Trust me. And the second thing was, I asked you to call someone that wasn't here and remind them of the sermon so they can get on the same page. Hopefully you all did that as well. But Psalm 95, we're learning and knowing how to worship freshly. To God, it'll bring you into His presence in a unique way. Fresh worship will bring you peace. Fresh worship will bring you strength. Fresh worship will bring you wisdom. But above all, it'll revitalize your walk and your relationship with the Father. It is easy to take advantage of someone when you're with them every day. You don't really ignore them, but you really don't recognize them either in everything that they do for you. Until that person doesn't do it anymore. Each and every one of us has loved ones that love us so much that they're willing to sacrifice to make the betterment of our life. And we hold them dear for that. But you have an almighty God, an all-knowing, all-loving, all-wonderful, powerful God, who's willing to do that for you. Every day, he deserves worship. So take time daily for fresh worship, and you will see that your walk will be strengthened. Let me give you three points on fresh worship. Psalms 95, verses 1 through 5. Come, let us shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let us enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout triumphantly to him in song. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. The depths of the earth are in his hands, and the mountain peaks are his. The sea is his. He made it. His hands formed the dry land. So there's some points that I'm going to drag out of these verses. First couple of verses that you'll see in verse 1 reminds us that we have to recognize that there is a reliance upon our God to create that foundation. You have to understand you belong to God. 
You have to understand that you're bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have to understand that He is this amazing God that loves you unconditionally. And the way you do that is that you understand every morning that you surrender your will and you bend your knee to a mighty God and He leads you daily. We are reliant, if you understand it or not, upon God's grace and mercy daily because none of us are perfect. So we need to know that there is a reliance in, in the foundation of worship, walking through with us every day. Verse 1 talks about the rock of our salvation. This brings us to a vision and understanding of God's steadfast character. Our immovable, unchanging Lord. Some place that we can look our faith to. A rock, our foundation. When trials and tribulations come, he's there. When the boats are in the water and the water starts to toss and turn and it gets pretty violent and rough, they anchor. They drop their anchor and hook it to keep them steady. Our anchor should be hooked to the rock of our salvation. Our anchor should be hooked to the realization that God is in control and that those of us who think that we are in control, it is an illusion. We control nothing. Psalms 18 verses 1 and 2, I like to read this. I read this this summer when I was seeking this freshness. It says, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my mountain where I go, or where I seek refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. These are wonderful descriptions of a God that loves you unconditionally, of a God that deserves our worship and our obedience. Verse 2 goes on to say, Let us enter into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout triumphantly in song. What a wonderful picture it is. It brings us to a fresh worship that brings us to the throne in a new way. Fresh worship that brings us, that, that brings the feeling of true love and the sacrifice that he gave for us. First worship that brings us to the realization that God has unconditional love for us and He is steadfast and that we can count on Him and that where we go, He goes. I often pray when we were allowed to do hospital visits before they went through those doors of surgery, I would pray that we have to stop here, but God doesn't. Jesus goes right back there with you. There is no barrier that our Lord can't cross. There's no way that Satan can stop him from touching us. He deserves worship. Verse 3 talks about being a great God, worthy of our fresh worship. We need to realize and celebrate the Lord's kingship. Psalms 29, 1 and 2 says, a scribe, and you remember last week I told you a scribe means concrete, something strong, durable. Ascribe to Yahweh, you heavenly bodies, beings. Ascribe to the Lord, glory and strength. Ascribe to Yahweh, the glory due his name. Worship Yahweh in the splendor of his holiness. This takes effort. And time for God. And that time and that effort should be concrete. It should be set in stone for you. There's nothing that should come before your God. Now I know you're all busy and I know you catch yourself coming and going and you chase your tail throughout the day and, and it just seems like the world just heaps more and more upon you and you're trying to find time to do it and you're juggling life but I don't care. It doesn't come before God. God is not flexible on this. 
First commandment says that thou shalt have no other gods before me. Matthew tells us that we should seek the kingdom first. This isn't a request. This is a command by your master, your Lord. We don't have the right to pencil any one we want. We should set our boundaries around worship of God first, and then everything else fills in. Verses 4 and 5 go on to say, The depths of the earth are in his hands, and the mountain peaks are his. The sea is his, he made it, his hands formed the dry land. This is a picture of how vast our God is. The Almighty Lord that we can't seem to understand the vastness of his knowledge and the acts that he does. But God understands the uncomprehensible uncom things, such as the foundations of the earth, because he's the one that created them. Jeremiah 31, 37 says, This is what the Lord says. If the heavens above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth below, below explored, I will reject all of Israel's descendants, because all they have done. This is the Lord's declaration. God is an eternal God. He understands everything or he wouldn't be God. But we go on to see that with all our vast knowledge and all our vast science, we still haven't explored the depths of the ocean. We still can't get down there to see what God created. With all our vast science and technology, we still haven't come and explored all the heavens and space. We haven't seen all the stars. We haven't seen the edges of the universe. <clears throat> so next time that we think that we've got this, or that we're relying upon ourselves to get through this day, you just remember, until you can go to the bottom of the ocean, and I'm talking about all the way to the bottom, or to the edges of space, you ain't all that in a bag of chips. God is your God. God should be relied upon. God should be worshipped. God should get the glory. We do not take the glory from our God. Our knowledge is limited, but God's isn't. We worship a mighty God. And if that don't put you in awe and fresh worship, I don't know what will. God made the heavens and the earth. They belong to Him. He has ownership of us. He made us out of the dirt and out of a rib. We belong to Him. We need to serve Him. Let's go on down through verses 6 and 7. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the sheep under His care. We come to a different side of worship. The first five verses was talking about singing, shouting, giving praise, and that's awesome. But this is talking about a different kind of worship, just as vital as the first side of worship but also ministering to ourselves that lets us grow in who we are in Jesus Christ. With verse 6, it says, The same God who created the world and created humanity as well, both the cosmos and humanity, kneel before the Creator. This is a different approach to worship, kneeling and bowing, and probably in silence. This is a worship of seeking. A worship of seeking, a worship of time, a worship of hearing his voice, being still and knowing that he is your God. It is fantastic to praise God and give him worship, and that it seems like our worship time goes so quick. But there should be time that we search the heavens to hear his voice. There should be times that we should be still and listen. Should be times that you've blocked out time and time doesn't matter when you come before your God as you, as you sit quietly and you meditate and you listen for his, his voice throughout the heavens and you search what God's direction wants from you 
and you are just acknowledging that you belong to a mighty God and that you are sitting here as a vessel to be used at his calling, to hear his voice and come to a time to reflect the understanding that you belong to someone else, that God is in control of your life. It's almost extinct. When I ask folks about their quiet time, they tell me what's going on in their quiet time. Just once it would say, just love to hear him say, you know, I sat for 45 minutes and didn't do it then. Except realize how an awesome God he is. And I listened for his voice. God serves the dual role, role in verse 7 as creator and shepherd. Isaiah 43, 1 and 15. It says, now this is what the Lord says, the one who created Jacob and the one who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, and you are mine. What a wonderful voice, verse that is. I have created you. I have formed you. And I have redeemed you, and you are mine. Verse 15 goes on to say, I am Yahweh, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. When's the last time you were thinking as God is your King? As God is your Creator? When's the last time that you thought about the reverence of Him sitting on the throne and giving you permission to come into His courtroom? giving you permission to bow down at his throne. Back in the old days, in the Old Testament, if you walked into a king's throne room without his permission, you were executed. But this mighty God who sits on the throne has given us that permission through our high priest, who is Jesus Christ. To have access to him any time that we would want to worship him. Any time that we would want to seek peace or stability in this troubled world, any time that you want comfort, any time that you want to lay your petitions before Him, any time that you want to go to the throne room, the privilege is yours. But understand this, He is King. He doesn't work for you. He blesses you by doing what's best for you in His vast knowledge. And still there are Christians that get mad for not doing what he wants them to do for him. Can you imagine that? I'm mad at God. Because God didn't do it the way I thought it should have been done. God is master. God is creator. God has formed you, redeemed you, and now owns you. Comes up to that real short term, know your role and shut your hole. <laughs> know who you are when it comes to God. Remember the privilege it is to serve your God. What a wonderful privilege it is that the vast and mighty God of this universe has time for you any time that you wish to give him worship. Any time that you wish to give him a quiet time or praise or fresh worship, God's there for you. It's what I like about Psalms 95. It reminds us about fresh worship. It reminds us that there's two different sides of worship. And then it reminds us of this, the warning. Remembering the past to worship freshly in the present. I'm sure that you can all draw on your own personal experiences of time that's pretty dark. A time that you was walking away from God after being saved. A time that, that you're really just not 
happy with. Sure, one not want to show them. But you did not outrun God's grace. And remembering that time and then remembering how God brought you out of that time and you came back to worship and He loved you just as much when you came back as He was when the first time. He deserves fresh worship daily. Reading verses 8 through 11. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on that day of Massa in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years I was disgusted with the generation. I said they are a people whose hearts go astray. They do not know my ways. So I swore in my anger that they would not enter in my rest. Of course, you know he's reflecting on Exodus 17, 1 through 7, and Numbers 20 through 2 and 13, where Moses refused to go into the promised land. Meribah means quarreling, and Masa means testing. Remembering the past warns us not to harden our hearts against God and not to rely on self-reliance. Don't hook your anchor to your gifts and the abilities that you have. They will fail you. Hook your anchor to the rock of our salvation. It is not the path for his disciples, self-reliance. It's not the path. For what you see in physical things is not the same as faith. Faith is the things that you do not see. When Moses sent the uh, spies into the, uh, the promised land and they come back and they told them what was going on, they gave them the facts and they, you remember the two, Caleb and Joshua said, let's go. No, no. We're looking at all the facts and the self-reliance came in and the self-knowledge, the, the, the very people, including Moses, who was led by a cloud in the morning, fire by night, who, who he split the, the Red Sea for, who God had directed them and rained down manna for them to eat and provided their needs time and time again, gave them water to drink time and time again. He came through as a faithful God and then the moment came and they chose to think of their own wisdom. They chose to rely on their sons and they said, no, even though you are that God that provided every need, even though you are that God that shows us the power that you have, we're not going in there. And then God said, then this is your punishment. You've hardened your hearts. People, God shows you daily that he loves you. Daily that he walks with you. Daily that he gets you through the trials and tribulations. He gives you wisdom daily. Every day of your life, God is with you. That's what Jesus promised. I'll be with you forever and always. And yet, we still fall to human nature and self-reliance. We still say, you know what, I can't get up 15 minutes early to give me fresh worship. I barely get enough sleep as it is. Not your call. God demands worship. God demands to be praised. Every day we walk away from God voluntarily or willingly. And yet God's grace and love is there for us every day. And then when we make that mistake and we say we're sorry to our Lord, He loves you just as much. We need to break the illusion. Listen, the reason that we're going through this is that we're going to study spiritual warfare starting in October. But the reason that we're doing this is to break the illusion that you have any control of anything. And the only power that you have is that self-ministering and that quiet time that you're giving God as you're getting back strength and wisdom and peace from an almighty God that will take that time. Stop thinking that it's on remote control. It's not. God deserves daily worship. 
And if you want to get through spiritual warfare, if you want to be the, the warrior that God wants you to be, then you've got to learn to minister to yourself as well as worship your God. There is strength to be found in quiet time. There is strength to be found in praise and worship. And we just let it slide by every day. And then we wonder why we're so weak. Some say, I can't wait for Sunday. I get recharged on Sunday. That's wonderful. But that recharge is waiting for you daily. God desires so much for your worship that he's given you the ability, the privilege, and the responsibility to come to his throne any time that you want. We've got to quit being lazy or ignorant about our walk and who we are in Christ. The enemy is eating this society up. It's eating this country up. You don't believe me? Take an hour and sit down in front of the news. What you can believe of it. Check your bank accounts and your last statements. It sounds, seems like inflation is eating us alive. God is with us. And he wants to minister to you. And he wants you to have peace. But you've got to desire it. You've got to be passionate about it. You've got to want it. He's given you all the tools, but you're the one that's got to work those tools. It's time to serve your God in a way that strengthens your walk. That's what worship does. Verses 10 and 11 says, God deals with us in righteousness and in justice, even when he was mad with the people for the 40 years and would not let them enter the promised land. He protected them. They didn't come to harm. They weren't in wars. They just couldn't cross over. Truly worshiping God is a must for the people that love him. It's a must for your walk daily. It's a must for your spiritual warfare. It's a must to serve your God with a sacrificial, loving heart. Willing to put God first in everything that you do. And then everything else comes after. In a minute, we're going to give the invitation. But if you bow your heads with me, close your eyes for just a minute. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, or you're here today and you're not sure you'd go to heaven if you died today, you haven't anchored yourself into that rock. Maybe you've just walked away. The interesting thing is that you need to know from this sermon is that it, He's here. It's okay. He still loves you unconditionally. So if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, all you have to do is say this prayer. You don't have to say that loud, but you do have to mean it. Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm lost and I need you in my life. Replace my will with yours and I will follow you for an eternity. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Every head still bowed and every eye still closed. If you said that prayer through our video ministry, welcome to the family of God. We invite you to come here to Shine Light Baptist Church. The address is on the screen. Tell us about that decision that you made so that we can help you get started as a disciple. Maybe you have a home church. Maybe you have a church family that you're comfortable with. Then we encourage you to go to that pastor and tell them about the decision that you made today and let them start you on your path as a disciple. If you're here today and you said that prayer, All I'm going to ask you to do is raise your head. I'm going to ask you three questions. Would there be one that said that prayer today? All right, maybe you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Maybe you find yourself struggling. Maybe you find yourself not able to tap into all those things that God promises that he'll give us. Maybe you find yourself discouraged in your walk or disappointed with your God. I'm here to tell you that your anchor is not where it needs to be. 
this altar will be open for you as well. To my right and your left, there's a spot at this altar to take care of things with God on your own. To my left, your right, we have a prayer warrior standing by to pray with you. Our prayer warrior will be open. Brother Richard and Pastor Glenn's back there as well. If you need someone to pray with, they're with you. Our job at Shining Light is to make you walk stronger when you leave than when it was when you came. Because God loves you. He loved us so much that he blessed us with this building. He blessed us with every person that's in it. Every person that is willing to serve their God. Help you with corporate fellowship. Alright, you may raise your head, stand with us if you will. Amen.